Hi, this is Jake, and recently I visited Carrie, and in the excitement of all, we kind of forgot to record an introduction, so here it is. And so, uh, here's what we forgot to say. Um, my name is Jake, Carrie is the other host, and this is Love You Like Crazy, a podcast where we talk about young adult books. And we are a member of the Ear Trumpet Audio Network, and they have a Patreon if you search for uh, Ear Trumpet or Ear Trumpet Audio Patreon, you'll find it. Uh, you can pledge money every month to support the shows on the network. And if you re- pledge at the $5 or higher level, uh, you will get access to bonus content, such as another episode we recorded while I was down there uh, where we talked about the Josie and the Pussycats movie. And that sounded a little something like this. Let's let's list the elements of this okay. room. <laughs> this room is lovely. Um, it's got a nice blue hue to it due to the um, aquarium water. Yep. Which is like a, a almost a pure aqua. There's a bunch of beluga whales <laughs> swimming around. A whole lot of beluga whales. Baby beluga in the deep blue sea. Swim so wild and you swim so free. And behind the beluga whales is a giant Evian ad. Yeah. So they're having a moment. It's impossible to pay attention to the moment. <laughs> it's I like, tried. I they, failed. They're like, oh, we're about to kiss. And then a beluga yeah. whale goes by. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, how can you make out when there's a fucking beluga whale right there? Right. And an Evian ad and another beluga whale. And I can't make out with all these beluga whales behind me. Right. And then at the end of it, uh, a, a dude in a uh, scuba gear with a sign that says, I love you, Josie. Or I love Josie and the Pussycat, something like that. Like takes a picture of them and they're all like yeah. eh. so that, uh, that ruins the moment there's no makey outies so i think those are the main things that i missed um we are talking about the hazel wood by melissa albert we're gonna swear we're gonna talk a, a lot of spoilers um and it's a good book that we both liked a lot so if you're worried about spoilers and you think you might read the book Pause this episode now, go read the book, and then come back and listen to it. But otherwise, keep listening, and we hope you enjoy it. Okay, so welcome to North Carolina. Yay! You're here! I'm in North Carolina. I woke up 3 a.m. I've been on a plane most of the day. That is the worst, but welcome! Thank you. <laughs> I feel very welcome. I have a uh, Diet Dr. Pepper uh, in my left hand. I have one on my right, so yeah. we're doing Okay. Um, we're going to talk about a delightful book chosen by a listener, and it is The Hazel Wood by Melissa Albert. And the listener who recommended it was Jody Redacted. <gasps> Jody Redacted. Thank you so much. I really liked this book. Me too. Thanks, Jody. Um, I should also thank Alex Redacted for sending in a book recommendation as well, which was uh, The Murmurings by Carly Ann West which looked like an interesting book. Um, I think the main reason we didn't pick that one is that it has kind of a, a suicide elements in it, I think. And I can't read suicide. Yeah. So, so we're going to skip that one, but we do appreciate the suggestion. Especially since it sounds creepy and I do love creepy. Yeah. So thank you. Yes. Uh, cool. So what, so, Okay. So we both liked this book a lot. We did. Um, This is sort of um, somewhere between modern retelling of fairy tales and total immersion into being a fairy tale. Yeah. Kind of the setup is that the the main character's grandmother wrote this book of fairy tales, like, I forget, 50 years ago or something. And it became this kind of cult phenomenon. Yeah. Very few people have read it um, because there weren't that many copies that, that came out, but everyone who did read it became immediately obsessed with it. Yeah. And so these weird things kind of start happening. Um, The, like these fans are showing up from time to time and like try you know, kidnapping going up, her. Well, yeah, <laughs> kidnapping her, going up to her in like a grocery store and like trying to get get her and her mother to tell them stuff about the fair, you know, about this book. And 
um, and so on. Uh, and then things just get progressively weirder and creepier. And so, uh, yeah, the the grandmother lives on a, an estate called the Hazelwood, and she wrote a book called Tales from the Hinterland. And our main character, Alice, um, sort of has, she's never met her grandmother. She has these grand fantasies of what the Hazelwood estate looks like or would be like. But her mom's like, nah, dude, we're staying clear of that place. I don't like my mom. I don't like this place. We're not going there. You're never going to meet anybody. Bye. Um, But shit happens. Yeah. And there's. One of the things that I liked about the book is that, you know, even I think after you finish reading it, it's never entirely clear, you know, mm-hmm. like um, Alice and her mother kind of, uh, I want to use the word peripatetic, except I have no idea how it's pronounced. So <laughs> pretend I didn't say that. Uh, but they, you know, they basically don't live in one place for more than normally like a few months, it sounds like. They're, they're nomadic as fuck. Yeah. And part and part of that is that, you know, what is called in capital letters, the bad luck will show up if they stay in, in the same place too long. And it's never entirely clear, like, is, you know, I mean, eventually you, you're like, oh, yeah, that is really a thing. But any individual incident, it's not necessarily clear. No, I mean, because some of them are, are very, you know, normal things to happen. You know, you you your house catches on fire or, you know, you get a flood. These are things that happen, you know, right. my house flooded. Does that mean that I am capital B bad luck or Maybe. it's probably <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, or is there something supernatural happening? Right. Like the, uh, the, the hosts, you know, the starts hitting on, the mother, like these are things that don't yeah. necessarily have a supernatural, but on the yeah. other hand, maybe they do. Like it's hard to tell because. But there's also, you know, other things that happen that are a little weirder that make them move. Someone breaks into the house and breaks all the mirrors and fills all the cabinets with dead leaves. That's normal. Yeah, that's uh, that's kind of creepy as fuck. Waking up and having your hair elaborately braided. Yeah. Uh, uh, not normal. You cut your chin on a table after when you're doing a weird stunt and a weird glowing door appears in the wall. Also fucking <laughs> crazy and creepy. And one of the best things that ha Oh God, I love that story. Yeah. So these things are on a continuum. I think yeah. is what we're saying. <laughs> Someone coming up to you in the grocery store. A little weird, but pretty benign. Or the the redheaded guy, like showing up in his blue Mustang. I think was it a Mustang? It was it was a blue car. Uh, I actually wrote it down for. Some I thought it was reason. a Pontiac. I'm going to search my notes for blue. There we go. Oh, Buick. It says. Okay, so I was. You were closer. I was closer. Yeah. Um, I, was like, I thought it was a hoopty. So he shows up. He says, he, "You know, this is when Alice is six. Shows up. Uh, tells her that he knows her grandmother and is." gonna take her to see her um takes her in his car uh takes her out for pancakes blueberry pancakes Mm -hmm. i believe correct um and then the police track them down (laughs) and and take her back and it turns out later that he's actually from the hinterland which is a real place yeah and alice is it turns out from a story she's not actually from earth she's from the hinterland and he's in the story as well the same story Mm -hmm. he's either trying to take her back to to do her story or taking her back to break the story. But either way, he's trying to take her back to the fucking hinterland. But he's sweet talking her with pancakes. I mean, I don't know. That would make me go anywhere. Um, <laughs> Where are we going for lunch, Carrie? <laughs> <laughs> Why? No, no, no. <laughs> no reason. No reason. No reason. Um, he... Well, he leaves. He's the one who leaves her the feather comb and bone in her coffee shop. So I'm guessing it's probably the latter that he's trying to do. Although, well, he's the brother. He's, he's like the, the younger yeah, he's brother. The brother. He's the brother. Um, so he's either trying to get her, you know. So no matter what, he's trying to get her through the halfway wood to get to the hinterland. So either way, she's going to need those three things to get there. Um, but at the, you know, we don't know what's going to happen when she gets there. I think um, when you're first reading the book, you're not sure if he's a bad guy or a good guy. Right. And I'm still not quite sure. 
Um, well, but I'm guessing more good than bad. At the end, he is the one who tries to break. Like, so when the, when they go back, she um, re-enters her story. Yeah. Because the uh, the story weaver, I think. Story spinner. Story spinner, yeah. Um, the story spinner tells her that the only way that she can get back to Earth is if she completes the story. Which is not true at all. It's not true. Um, like, I mean, it's true in the sense that the story never ends. So, <laughs> you know, good luck. Yeah. Um, which the story spinner also, you know, she says, when you finish the story, it starts over again. Yeah. So, like, that that information isn't there. But anyway. So, um, part of the story of Alice Three Times, mm -hmm. which is her story name, is that, um, you know, like, she's a princess. She sets these tasks for suitors. Most of them fail and die. But these two brothers manage to succeed to bring her ice from this remote location. And say that they're going to take her and make, they're not going to marry her, but they're going to take her and make her the, their servant. And the elder brother kind of seems like the ringleader for all that. And then there's this younger brother also, who's the one who cut the ice. Uh, and he's the redheaded guy. Mm -hmm. And so during one of the, some iteration of the story, the, the younger brother says, uh, you know, tries to break her out tries to break out of the story with her. Yeah. Which he does by like, there's a point where she kills the older brother. Uh, she's like frozen solid. The older brother is frozen solid. And in the ordinary way, the story goes, the younger brother then like kicks her and runs away with his horse. And then terrible things happen. Um, but in this, in this iteration, instead, like she, he breathes on her eyes. So her eyes are unfrozen and she can see him. And then she recognizes him from Earth. Yeah. And so they try to break out, but they can't because the story is too strong. Yeah. I think my my point was, um, you know, as a reader, yeah, the, this guy gives her these things so she can get back. And you're like, is this for his sake or for oh, her? Yeah, totally. No, that's that's totally. Yeah. Because you don't know, like. You know, is this is this just him trying to get these people to not eat the same bite of food for 17 years, which was, was one of the most horrific parts of the whole book, where these people who are in this, you know, grand ballroom eating and they're all miserable and in pain and... I, I didn't know if he was doing this to sort of help himself or to break free. Right. Um, Which I guess both sort of help him, but one is a probably more desirable outcome than the other. I, I would. Uh, yeah. So I guess I, I would modify, <laughs> say that he's a good guy per se, as he's not the worst person. He's not the worst book. person in this book at all, but I don't know who... <laughs> Is I have some suspicions as to who is, but I don't know 100% for sure who the, the worst person in this book is. Yeah. Uh, right. There are plenty of candidates. This is a book where yeah. most people are kind of jerks. I would <laughs> including say. Including the protagonist. Yeah. The, the, the protagonist is kind of a jerk. And, and I think one of the things the book makes delightfully ambiguous is why she's such a jerk. Um. You know, she's Alice three times. She is a monster. She is a bad guy in a fairy tale. She is horrific. But she's also a person who hasn't lived in the same place for more than a couple of months at a time. Spent most of her life bouncing from place to place. So never making any connections with other people besides her mom. So, of course, she's going to be cold, standoffish, and, and uncomfortable in the world um, because she has never really had a place in it. But also, she's not from the world. Um, I don't know where I'm going with that. No, I, I – right. Like, but um, I don't know if that makes her a bad guy or a good guy. Um, but I think it makes her a complicated character. Yeah. And I think that's what is – really interesting about her. I think, you know, if you read the book at face value, she's just a shit heel. 
She is terrible. She is selfish. She is weird. She is mean. She is racist. But she's also not a people. Yeah. Um, and like racist. Well, when, when she was in the car with Ellery and she's arguing with the cops and she's making a big fucking stink and he's just like, shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. And she's like, why are you even upset? You're going to be fine. You're rich. And he's like, um, sweetie, I'm also black. She's like, well, not all the way. And I was like, oh, you better shut your mouth, Alice. You're making me uncomfortable. Did you see Get Out? I haven't because I'm afraid of scary movies. Oh, that's right. There's a scene early on that reminded me of this. So in the future, the number to call is Animal Control Services. Yes, sorry about that. It's just, just sorry. So you guys uh, coming up from the city? Yeah, yeah. My parents are from the Lake Ponico area. We're just heading up there for the weekend. Mm. Sir, can I see your license, please? Wait, why? Yeah, I have state ID. No, no, no. He wasn't driving. I didn't ask who was driving. I asked to see his ID. Yeah, why? That doesn't make any sense. Here. No, no, no. Fuck that. You don't have to give him your ID because you haven't done anything wrong. Maybe, maybe, it's okay. Come on. Anytime there is an incident... We have every right to That's ask. bullshit. Ma'am, the... Everything all right, Ryan? Yeah, I'm good. Get that headlight fixed. And that mirror. Thank you, officer. Uh, we're not talking about that movie, and I don't want to give spoilers. Um... We can talk about that later because <laughs> it's neat. Uh, anyway, so so there is like that kind of. Uh, I mean, she she acts like everybody else is really privileged. Yeah. But she's really fucking privileged. True. I mean, she's acting like, oh, well, you know, my stepsister, Audrey, is so rich. She's She's got all this. She's got all that. This guy, Ellery, he's um, amazingly rich. Um, but she sort of has this ability to chameleon herself in a lot of ways um, that they ne- they can't. Um, so I think, I, I don't know. There are a lot of people in this book too. <laughs> There's there a lot of fucking people. Did you, what did you think of her relationship to Audrey? I thought it was a really interesting relationship where Audrey, Audrey wanted to be, sarcastic with her but didn't like it if Alice veered from her story if I can sort of use this capital S story metaphor um, because when you know they're talking about something you know Alice sort of went off off book Mm. Audrey did not like that because Audrey expects people to have their place And, and so I thought they had a a better relationship than I think most step siblings do. But it also is, you know, like what their script is, is that they're just really mean to each other. They're fairly superficial and there's nothing below their sarcasm and meanness until later. Yeah. They have a a delightful conversation. um, But it's the one and only that they'll probably ever have again in their lives. Right. Yeah, that's true. Um, so the story thing, so I was kind of like, I feel like this book kind of has this sort of opposition between, you know, stories and choice. There's kind of something mm-hmm. like that, um, which I am basically using as an excuse to read this little bit of dialogue. I would love you to. <laughs> where, where Alice is um, at her most carry like perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> as i'm talking about her being kind of a bad guy you're like oh yeah. it's um, she's gonna carry uh, like this is so this is a dis- discussion between finch and alice when they're like when they're trying to find the hinterland and they have sort of a general idea of where yeah. it is oh and by the way finch is a guy who she knows from school who is um a deep fan yeah of, a fanboy of tales from the hinterland which you would not necessarily expect um from really anybody 
But he's, you know, kind of awesome and I love him. And I'm so glad that they didn't go romantical. Yeah, right. They never really, there's always, there's an attraction there, but there's, they never there's actually. There's totally an attraction, but they never go there and it, it, there's no way for them to go there anymore. Dot, dot, dot. Edit this out. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm not sure how we're going to do this now that I think of it. Okay. So they're trying to find the hinterland and they're, they're pretty close, they think. Uh, and then some like kind of freaky things start happening. So they go to stay in a hotel for the night and the next morning they get up and discover that their rental car is completely filled with seawater, including fish, uh, you know, just filled to the brim. Yeah, some of the freaky things that have been happening um, that are in the town or around the town that they think they need to go to are a lot of people keep turning up dead. Yes. Right. Um, and so some stuff is happening. She's seen some things, but really um, they're stopping at a hotel because um, basically a cop told them to turn around. They couldn't go any further. So do uh, you want to start reading that? I thought he'd be freaked out or aggressively calm in that finch way I was growing accustomed to or even pissed. But when he turned toward me, he looked reverent. The hinterland did this. Yes. We can't go back to New York now. We were never going back to New York. No, I mean, even if we wanted to, it's like we have no choice but to keep going. What? Yes, we do. We have a choice and we're choosing it. This isn't fate, Finch. This is getting bullied by supernatural assholes. And scene. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bullied by supernatural assholes. There's a lot of that in this book. There's a lot of supernatural assholery. Yes. Um, which I loved. Mm -hmm. As creepy things were happening, um, you know, as uh, she's a teenager. So the stuff that happened when she was younger, you know, that's fine. But when she gets to New York, um, things keep happening. Like she's on the subway and someone... Whistles, uh, go ask Alice repeatedly. And she's like, what the fuck? And her mom's like, eh, it's New York. Um, but other things keep happening. You know, she sees the redheaded man again, and he looks exactly the same. And he leaves her some stuff. So stuff is happening. And also, you know, you're not sure. Is this is this weird? Is this not weird? Is she imagining this? Um they go into a bookstore to, to buy a copy of the book that had just shown up. That was so fucking creepy. That was so fucking creepy. And they open the book, and inside the book is a photograph. Of them taking the previous night while they were sleeping. I know, that's so <laughs> scary! It was amazing! And, and it's like, so, like, a lot of the things, one of the things that makes it extra creepy for me is, like, these things where it's, it's supernatural, but it's also like real world. It's, so it's totally real world. So it's like a, it's a Polaroid photo. So it's like something, you know, it's something, something here. was here. But, uh, but how did they get there and what else are they capable of? Or are they human and they're just being scary? Right. Um, but we know that they're supernatural assholes and they freak the shit out of them and me. And I loved it. Yeah. Um. So at one point it's revealed that, that Finch has kind of betrayed her or has been working um, for the hinterland. He has. I mean, I didn't really see it as a betrayal and I totally get why it's supposed to be a betrayal, but she kept going of her own accord. Right. I mean, he kept saying, Hey, do you want to turn back? And she says, no, we don't have a choice. So is it really a betrayal or were they just sort of, I think it was. I mean, okay. So, uh, Mr. Moral Purity over here, I feel like asking your friend, do you want to turn back? We can totally turn back if you want to turn back, is one thing. But saying, so while you were unconscious after the bookstore, I talked to, um, what's her name? Twice Killed Catherine? Yeah, I talked to Twice Killed Catherine and that creepy kid that's been following you. And they said, you should totally bring your friend to this place. Uh, you know, like, I feel like they're disclosing that information. Maybe, but I think she was going to go there anyway. No, I agree. But she would have been more prepared, perhaps. Maybe. Maybe not. I mean. I mean, I think Finch wants to believe that he's got no choice and that he's acting for the best. But I think he's 
you know, he's letting his fandom self overwhelm his friend self. But a bit. also knowing these these stories and how horrific they are. I mean, if you read any of the Grimm's fairy tales, they're they're awful. Yeah. I mean, they're amazing, but they're awful. Why would you want to go there? Right. Well, because you think your mother's there, I guess. Well, I know, but for him. Oh. Even as a, a deep fan, as he calls himself, um, why would you want to go there knowing how horrific it is and knowing that these stories are probably even more horrific than the Grimm's stories? But we'll get to read that soon enough because Tales from the Hinterland, it <laughs> will come out um, soonish. Um, so yeah. thanks, Melissa, for writing that so I can read more of it. I like that his uh, his fallback position was like, hey, maybe, how about Narnia? Why don't we go to Narnia instead? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go to Narnia. <laughs> not big on the old Christian allegories? I am not. Um, as much as I love a good lion dying for my sins i think i'm gonna skip it all right so they they go to that they go to the hazelwood they go to the hinterland um or or maybe not both of them because <laughs> somebody pays for it in blood yeah sorry ellery you die right and they want twice killed Catherine and the kid who i don't think is ever identified no i don't such. think he is either um just a guy in a story. Yeah. Uh, so they want, they, they're like, you can either kill yourself or both of you will die. So pick. And she picks not killing herself. And so, uh, the kid kills, um, Ellery and then twice killed. Catherine says, have you ever heard of bluffing? <laughs> like, she's like, well, we, you know, we don't really have any leverage now, but they, Let's see. I'm a little vague on this part. They kind of knock her out or she loses consciousness or something. Mm -hmm. They take her to the half, what's it? The halfway wood? The halfway wood, yeah. Which is seems like kind of a buffer region between the hinterland and Earth. Yeah, it's like a, I don't know, it's a gate. And that's where the Hazelwood actually is, where the grandmother lives. Yeah, and it's where um, Alice's mom grew up. She grew up in um, at the Hazelwood in the Halfway Wood, which is a really weird place to grow up. Um, as we see um, Alice going through it, we can sort of imagine how horrific and amazing and magical and awful Ella's childhood would have been like. Yeah. Because, you know, you've got fairies and stories and all this stuff, but also... It's scary. And the woods will eat you alive. So it turns out that, you know, Alice always thought that Ella, Ella was her mother. But it turns out that Ella... Kidnapped her. Kidnapped her, essentially, uh, <laughs> from her terrible parents. Yeah, she she feels like she rescued her. But also, it wasn't necessarily her place to rescue her. Right. It's a little... Yeah, like it's kind of hard to... It's hard to completely justify it. I mean, of course, you can easily justify it because, you know, the first sentence of, of, of the story is like, this baby was born with black eyes and they were so scared they couldn't even wash her. Right. You know, exactly how it goes, I don't remember. But it's just like, oh, God, this girl has the worst childhood and she keeps, you know growing at random times and everyone is awful to her and then she dies awfully over and over and over again. Of course you want to break that cycle. But there are consequences. But there are aren't. consequences to that. And also, you know, is it her place to take somebody out of their story? Right. But it it all works out. Yeah. Sorta. <laughs> sorta. Um yeah, I think there's a lot of stuff in the book, as you said, about, you know, choice versus um, story. And I think that's one of the times where you're like, is the story better or, or worse? And it's probably worse. Yeah, it seems like the story, first of all, like the stories, all these, all the stories in the book are bad or in 
in this book. Yeah. As well as the original book that Alice's grandmother wrote. Like, yeah. They're all like terrible stories of terrible things. But it's also supposedly like this feminist retelling of stories. Like it's like everyone who has read it thinks of it as as a feminist book. And I'm like, maybe because all of the women are the monsters and they kill a whole lot of men. <laughs> but I don't know if I would consider it a feminist. But yeah, other um, people in this book say that that is how it is read. Right. Um, yeah. But it's always like kind of hard to describe all like people i don't know yeah Yeah. um you said that so even outside of fairy tale lands like stories are really important and Mm -hmm. people kind of get trapped in them yeah that kind of struck me on when i was doing my reread which i didn't quite complete on the plane this morning (laughs) because i I fell asleep (laughs) (laughs) you were up at three yeah um i fell asleep because I was incredibly tired. This book is very compelling. <laughs> I should be clear about that. Um, where uh, Audrey tells Alice that uh, her dad is taking the day off of work. And that that means that they're about to get divorced. Mm-hmm. And she says, today's the day he calls a marriage counselor. He always does that so he can tell himself he tried. If history really wants to repeat itself, six months from now is when he leaves your mom for the counselor. Which is a nice detail. <laughs> but it doesn't matter who it is. Either Ella jumps first or it ends with him meeting someone else because he's an addict like that. He's predictable as an effing book. So don't act like I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, And that really struck me as like, that's that's another loop. That's mm-hmm. like similar to the loop that Alice finds herself in yeah. towards the end of the book. An equally, well, maybe not equally, but also a destructive one. Mm-hmm. And... There's also a point, I didn't copy it, or I didn't write it down, but um, where Alice says that Ella got married to uh, this guy, Harold. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, who's this kind of rich Wall Street douchebag sort of. Such a deep bag. <laughs> um, because, you know, she'd watch a lot of, essentially, while they were traveling, basically all Ella's mother did was watch Hallmark movies and like that's what you do yeah like you find you find the rich guy who seems like they're you know they have depths on unsuspected unexpected unsuspected depths and Mm -hmm. you marry him um so our friends over at life mark it's life mark a made for tv podcast are they um following this story and they're all gonna marry rich wall street douchebags i don't think so so i don't think just watching the movies Turns you vapid. No. <laughs> Just so happens that she wanted some stability and she thought that this would do it. It does not. Right. BT dubs. Um, I was just reading exactly how um, she got to the halfway wood and Catherine drove her there and dropped her off and said, and here you'll wander till death is preferable and you choose it. Yeah. That's and real dark. Like, yeah. And I was like, Catherine, why do you want her to kill herself so badly? Well, Later on, it says that, so, um, let's see, I think when she's talking to the best, you know, like the most grounded, most together characters in the book. <laughs> Janet and Ingrid. Janet and Ingrid, um, who are this lesbian couple who live in the hinterland. So Janet, who is from Earth, mm-hmm. Ingrid is an ex story, they call them, someone who's managed to break out of her story permanently. Uh, Janet is from Earth and actually uh, time between Earth and the hinterland. And also it seems like the hinterland and other parts of the hinterland is Mm -hmm. kind of wonky and it doesn't necessarily match up. But uh, she actually is the person who told Alice's grandmother how to get into the hinterland. Yes. Um, And what she says is if twice killed Catherine killed you, then that would be not go well for her. Um, I think because I don't know that it was entirely clear why, but I feel like because the story spinner would 
you know, wants to get Alice back into the story yeah. and would. Yeah, because when Alice slapped her, yeah, it hurt both of them quite a lot. So she probably can't kill her, but why she wants her dead? Because it would create a, a permanent portal, mm. is what um, Janet says, I believe. I missed it. I missed it entirely. The end. Um I really want to hear Twice Killed Catherine's story. Yeah. Yeah. It could be super creepy. It's going to be really creepy. Um, there are two stories that we hear, or three stories? I know of two. We hear most of um, Alice Three Times story, but we never hear the end of it, which I like. Yeah. Um, because also Alice never hears the end of it. Right. Which is helpful um, in her breaking out of the story. But also we, we get the... Um, the door. What is it called? The door that wasn't there. The door that wasn't there, which was one of the most amazingly creepy things ever. There's a high body count in that There's one. So many people die. We also get to meet Hansa the Traveler. Oh, that's right. We do meet Hansa. I don't think we know her story though. No. But I'm guessing she's she seemed a little bit um Little Red Riding Hood. So that's sort of where I went with, with her in my imagination. I sort of went Red red cape. Oh, and Jenny and the what, Night Woman, we hear like a little synopsis of, I think. What was her story? Let's see. She is, she, I, uh, I forget exactly what precipitates it, but she gets mad at her parents and she runs into this kid in the forest who like, is like, well, if you want to get revenge, you know, prick their heels. Oh, that's right. That's right. And then like use the blood to paint a stone in the garden or something. And it lets the night women into the house. And uh, all we're told is it doesn't go super well from there. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Which is fair. Yeah. The skinned maiden. Gets skinned over and over and over again. I guess. Um, Someone tries to intervene to keep her from being skinned. And we are once again told that doesn't go super well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. These other ones I don't think we necessarily know. I think we encounter the clockwood. Clockwork Bride. Because we, we do. Um, who else do we encounter? We encounter Super Creepy Guy, who might be the worst character in the whole book. Oh, yeah. Uh, cripes. What's his? He's the something or other king. The Briar King? The Briar King. Right. He I'm is in- disgusting. He is the one that smells like rotting woods. And, and he leaves uh, the... He title leave, page. Yeah, he leaves the notes for her. Um, not really a note, but he leaves the title. Yeah, the title page of her book and stinks up her house real bad. But, but he doesn't remember anything about it. Really, no. But he's awful. He's just a creepy, giant, scary guy that I am nervous about. So another thing I thought was really interesting in this book were all the refugees. So all yeah. these people who make it to the hinterland, um, who sort of live there and make their life there. There's a tavern. Everyone's got houses. You know, sometimes they get chocolate. Right. Um, but I thought that was really interesting that all these people were drawn to the hinterland, um, presumably through this book, but obviously through other ways since people got there before the book as well. But all these people sort of live there and and – don't necessarily want to leave. Right. Some some do, some don't. Some do, some don't. But I think... I like the guys, could, you know, it's like, there's no coffee here. There's no chocolate. <laughs> there's no cell phone reception. You know, it's like... <laughs> but also, I mean, if people find their way in and people find their way out because the the stories have... Uh, Twice Little Catherine finds her way out. The redheaded man finds his way out. Yeah. There are ways out, um, but they don't necessarily go. Yeah. Um, that was another thing. Like, there are a bunch of things in the book that aren't totally clear, but that I didn't mind that they were yeah. not totally clear because it's a, you know, it's a point of view book. And yeah. the main character, like, there's no real reason why. Yeah. It sounds like Althea was the first one who got out, mm-hmm. but other people were able to do so afterward. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Because she convinced the story spinner. Although, does that mean that Janet, because Janet knew how to get there. Yes. Does that mean Janet had already been there and came back? I don't think so. I think I think it's a little bit confusing the way she tells it, but I believe like she had done some research. She mm-hmm. had found this method. She was out celebrating that she had done this Good, good research. And then and, she met a, a pretty lady. Yeah. 
and the pretty lady was super excited about all this stuff as well. And so they work on it together. They fell in love or maybe not I think, quite. I don't think Althea did. I think Althea fell into manipulation. Yeah. She seems kind of manipulative. Yeah. She fell into, um, this is a good thing. Yeah. And um, she did her war reporting. Right. Well, she, she got there and then they were kind of stuck there. And then she got bored when she ran out of books and coffee and. I forget what the third thing was. Gin? Was oh, it? yeah. Maybe it was booze. <laughs> <laughs> Works for me. Cigarettes, possibly. I know she she, oh, yeah. she smoked and drank, so it could have been any of the above. But, yeah. So, when she was, when she was ready, she uh, convinced slash manipulated her way out. Yeah. But then she wrote the book, which meant that other things also were able yeah. to get out and other people were able to get in more easily. Yeah. She uh, sort of ripped the portal um, apart. I thought it was interesting. I, her, her daughter's name, Ella, um, yeah. I didn't realize was um, an, an, her, her, her full name is Vanella. Yeah. Or Vanilla. Um, but Jake told me it meant uh, from hell. <laughs> yes. Which makes a lot of sense if you think about where she grew up and also, you know, what the hinterland is um, and how her mother was one of the or was like the first person who was able to to escape from it. Um, Because one thing that um, Finch said when um, he was taking her to meet with Ness, who was the the scholar who had... found her way to the halfway wood. Her blog was so great. Her blog was so great. <laughs> it was so perfectly blog. <laughs> um, One of the things I liked about it is uh, <laughs> she's, she's just sort of talking, you know, like going on about, you know, this amazing, you know, her quest and how amazing it is and how like her boyfriend or not boyfriend, her dude who, her, her teaching assistant, her teaching assistant, uh, you know, is like not convinced of this theory, but she is pretty sure. And then at one point she says, uh, and this does get expensive. So, you know, <laughs> and there's a little link to her Patreon or whatever, <laughs> <laughs> which that's exactly that's yes. Yeah. Speaking of which, no, never Speaking mind. Of which, <laughs> pay us. Um, no, um, Finch, um, gets to the door and rings the doorbell or rings her apartment buzzer. And um, the voice comes down and she's like, you know, asks a riddle and he answers, you know, death. And she's like, how did you know that? It's because you're such a big fan. He's like, honestly, if, if there's an answer to any riddle, the answer is usually death. Yeah. I think I'm getting smarter. It's a piece of cake. And so I, I sort of kept that in the back of my mind. Like as I'm reading this book, like the answer is always death. And I think that that's, Basically, how one gets from the hinterland is one one dies, at least partially. And I think that's what happens with um, Althea. Some part of her soul is ripped, and that creates the, the portal. But I'm not entirely sure if my theory is correct. So if anyone would like to um, tell me I'm wrong, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> or join our Facebook group. <laughs> one or the other. The other one is fine, but I'll probably tell you to fuck off there. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I think, you know, if we're going for a supernatural asshole in this book, we're going to go with, you know, the story spinner isn't going to let you out for free. Yeah. Can I uh, talk about Dungeons and Dragons for a moment? Yes! <laughs> Have you ever played Dungeons and Dragons? No. Here's the thing. I've always wanted to play Dungeons and Dragons and I've never been cool enough. I've never. <laughs> I know. I know. I know that sounds dorky, um, but it's a, it's something I've always sort of wanted to get into, but I don't know anyone who plays or I have never known anyone who has invited me to play. Mm. So there you go. I would play Dungeons and Dragons with you if we lived in the same state. I know. I know we would, but... We don't. No. Anyway. Um, anyway, Dungeons and Dragons. So, like, your classic Dungeons and Dragons thing, there's this thing called alignment, which is sort of your morality. Mm-hmm. And there's kind of two axes. There's 
uh, lawful and chaotic, and then there's good and evil, mm-hmm. and then in the middle there's neutral. Uh, yeah, like like hot dog, my cat would be <laughs> um, chaotic evil, right? One hundred percent. Yeah. So the storyteller, uh, I feel like, is lawful evil. Absolutely, because she demands, or it demands, um, perfection. Right. It demands clockwork, um, but. You ain't going down without a fight. (laughs) And like the story, like, couldn't you have a story with a happy ending for once? Never. They exist. (laughs) Never. What I thought was interesting um, is that the storyteller or the story spinner was not of that world. Right. So where did the story spinner come from? Hell. Yeah. Uh, Apparently a third world of some kind. Come with hell. And so I, I did not quite finish the book second time around, so I sort of forget. But I feel like after she breaks out of the story... Um, it seems like the, the, the story spinner's power is kind of broken in a way. Mm -hmm. It seems like the hinterlands is kind of diminished. Yeah. It's starting to crumble. It's maybe not gone, but it's starting to have the potential of dismantling. And a bunch of the X stories moved to New York. It seems like, (laughs) and (laughs) they have sort of an, an, uh, AA sort of. I know that part was amazing. Like they have to go to some, like psychics back room once a week to talk about like how they're adjusting to be to being on earth yeah not having a story imposed on them anymore yeah it's uh it's neat did i have something to say other than that was neat that was neat i think um the other thing that is sort of interesting in the book and that they they talk about a few times um is how time works differently in the hinterland um so when Alice finally breaks th- free and gets home. It's been two years rather than two weeks or a month. So on paper, she's 19 and then in, in her imagination, uh, she's 17. So things work differently. So, um, you know, for Janet and Ingrid, they've been there for, well, Ingrid's been there forever. Uh, but Jan has been there for 50 years. But she hasn't aged 50 She years. hasn't aged at all. So I, I guess that's something that keeps coming up, and that's something that happens with a certain friend of ours, Mr. Ellery Finch. Yes, that's true. He uh, he was dead, by the way. Very right. dead. But maybe not. His throat was cut. Very cut. We saw him bleed out. Yes. Et cetera. It wasn't pleasant. Mm-mm. We don't recommend that. But, however, he's not 100% dead. He's no, it turns out. <laughs> mostly dead. I've seen worse. But when Alice sees him, it's been years for him. It's been yeah. two years. And he got a girlfriend, which I was like, thank God. <laughs> yes. Because I was so worried that it was going to be like the Alice and Ellery show and that she was going to like pine for him, but he's grown up now. Um, he, of course, wants the best for her. And he wants her to be safe and happy and and all of that. But he's like, nah, dude, I'm not going anywhere. Like, I got my life. You've you've been in this for a while. So he is he is older and and she is still 17. So when she goes back to New York, she's like, I'm not going back to school. I'm just gonna take my time. And her mom doesn't force her to do anything because, you know, she's she's not ready for college. She's only 17, um, and she is X story, and the world that she knew is very different. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think I really liked the fact that there were other people going through that with her, mm-hmm. and she was able to sort of ease back in on her terms. Um, whereas, you know, the first time she she made it to Earth, it was not necessarily on her terms. She was Ella Napped. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I like that. I uh, liked this book a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was curious. Uh, so I would say in my mind, it's kind of in, I guess, f- sort of four parts of different lengths. Like the, the longest part is kind of the beginning mm-hmm. while she's on earth, uh, basically up to the point where she enters Hazelwood mm-hmm. for the first time. And then she goes into Hazelwood and that doesn't last very long, but that I feel like is, that's where the book is I've kind of the most subjective and mm-hmm. it's all kind of from. Yeah. Like 
when I'm reading it, I'm like, is she really at Hazelwood or is she at a projection of the halfway wood that's tricking her? Right. Because she says it's exactly as she, she, as she imagined it. Right. Which she knows is suspicious. Yeah. Because she's never been there before. And, you know, her grandmother is there looking as she did on this photograph from what was it? Vanity Fair magazine or yeah. something, which obviously couldn't be true because she got this letter saying that the grandmother was dead. So yeah, I wasn't sure if that was really Hazelwood or not. Um, but yeah, so first right. part, pretty normal-ish. Second part, uh-oh. And then there's then there's the part in The Hinterlands. Mm-hmm. And then there's this the sort of epilogue. Yeah. So did a any of those like work particularly well or less well than others for you? You know, I, I, I've read some reviews of this book after yeah. I, after I read it and most people did not like the journey. And that was my favorite part. Yeah. I loved her talking about how she grew up and how she was a nomad and going to New York and her time in New York and how she's at this really fancy rich school and she doesn't quite fit in. Um, and then sort of following this mystery to the Hazelwood. Um, I loved that part. And then, you know, when they're in the halfway wood, I was like, okay, this is weird. And then the hinterland itself didn't captivate me in the way that the beginning did. Um, I didn't hate it, obviously, because I like the whole book. Um, how about you? Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, you know, because I, I had also read some reviews before I read it myself. I knew that some people didn't like the first part mm -hmm. as much as the other part. So I was kind of prepared to, but I, that was also my favorite part of the book, although yeah. I, I like the others. Um, the, the little section where she's, in the Hazelwood for the first time. That was the part where I was like, oh man, I hope the rest of the book isn't like this. Cause I could do this for some, you know, for a few pages, but yeah. if this is, you know, the second half of the book is all like this. That would be too much, but yeah, but, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it was, it was the good, it was a good length and so it worked for I me. I was glad it wasn't all Alice in Wonderland. Yes. Well, that's kind of funny. Cause, um, she, <laughs> The author posted on tw Twitter the other day. Uh, she's like, it turns out that if you uh, if you write a book with the main character of Alice that goes into a different reality, a lot of people will tell you will say that it's a dark retelling of Alice in Wonderland, which is not which it's not at all. Um, but I think if she'd spent more time in Hazelwood it would have felt more like it. Yeah, that, that could be. Because I think, you know, when she made it through the halfway wood and into the hinterland, um, it, it felt less Alice in Wonderland at that point. But I think, you know, her exploring this, this house and it being creepy and weird, um, things aren't quite what they seem, et cetera, et cetera. Like that was just like, yeah, maybe a little too Alice in Wonderland-y. Um, but then, then it ends, and I was grateful for that. Um, I don't know. I feel like that's. I feel like we've <laughs> talked about it. Is there anything else? Oh, you. One thing that, I mean, this is one thing that I, you mentioned earlier before we started recording that I think is worth mentioning again is that you liked that, uh, or you thought I shouldn't put words in your mouth, but the, that that. Alice has an evil stepfather instead of an evil stepmother. Yeah, I liked that. Um, I thought it was a, a, a good twist because he was a complete asshole. And, you know, not unlike um, an evil stepmother threw them out on the street. At gunpoint. At gunpoint. Like, Jesus Christ. Like, that was bad. I mean, of course, you know, some some stories literally just kidnapped them and, you know... <laughs> Probably, okay, he was under stress. But. Probably didn't treat him all that well, but still, to just be like, oh, by the way, um, my wife, who I love, and her daughter, um, I'm just going to throw you out and never think of you again. He was really awful. Um, but yeah, evil stepfather. I liked it. I thought it was a, a delightful twist um, to... 
the typical story. Yeah. This this was a really good book. I really liked it. I thought it was fun. Um, I read it, you know, I started it at like seven o'clock at night and I finished it the next day on my lunch break. Um, so I, I was up reading a lot. Um, and I didn't know much about the book before I started it because I, I sort of like going into stuff like this a little blind. Um, but then reading reviews afterwards, I mean, I could see some of their criticisms, but I think that it was really fun and different and creepy and it's everything I like in a book. And I can't wait to read Tales from the Hinterland. I know. Like I can't wait. This is a first novel. Like it's that's pretty good. Yeah, I think, you know, for being a first novel, I think it it could have been she definitely bit off a lot more than maybe she could have chewed. Um, but I think she did a good job with it. Um, I think because some of the stuff was not explained or some of the stuff, maybe she could have gone into a little more detail um, had she been a seasoned novelist. I think for a first, first go round, she did a really good job. There were some parts that I thought were maybe not as well thought out or maybe the pacing wasn't quite right. Hmm. You know, when she was when she was going through basically the three trials, like it just sort of zoomed through it and some of it didn't make any sense. Like, how did she know to give the comb to the person in the water? Right. Well, it was a mermaid kind of thing, I guess. But it wasn't really a mermaid. I don't even know because she, she just kept calling it like a fish person. Right. So I don't know how much hair it had. She didn't notice that. But she was just like, oh, here, take this. And if she had given it the bone instead, would it would it have taken that and then she'd be fucked? Like, I wanted there to be a reason for, mm. like, okay, there was a reason for the, the feather. The feather <sighs> made the wings. There was a, sort of a reason for the bone. Um, it became a sword-ish. Yeah, it was, the, well, that was like a real murder ballad kind of thing. Yeah. And they made a little fiddle of a breastbone Oh, the wind and rain Whose sound would melt the heart of stone Crying, oh, the dreadful wind uh, Yeah, I mean, I right. I, I That section of the book, I guess, was kind of... There was sort of a fairy tale or maybe even a dream logic to it. That And I think, you know, maybe... Maybe that could have been done a little better. Yeah. But I think, you know, for the world building that she did... She did a really good job. Yeah, I feel like in other first novels that we've read, um, the the more usual problem they have is over explaining rather than under explaining. Mm -hmm. So I think that this was, you know, like I said, it, a lot of the things, the fact that we don't necessarily like, we never really learn what the that the kid who's with twice killed Catherine, like who that is, what his story is, we never yeah. learn. But that's fine. Like we just know, okay, that's a story, kid, and. Yeah. You know, so I, I, I think that that, uh, yeah, I thought that was handled well, hmm. but yeah. Yeah. Um, I feel like there are other things I could say, but, uh, nothing too important. Yeah. It was a good book. Yeah. Thank you, Jody Redacted. Thank you for making me read this, this scary, wonderful, fantastic book. So, um, the next book we're going to read is, I think, if you agree, <laughs> Uh, a book that came out fairly recently. Um, another first book. It's uh, Ship It by Britta London. We can read that. I've read it. You've read it. I'm ready. Might as well talk <laughs> about it. I feel like there's things to say about there it. There are definitely things to say about it. Um, it is a problematic book in a lot of ways, and it's also a wish fulfillment book in a lot of ways. And so I found it infuriating and interesting. Yeah. So that's a good way to sell it <laughs> sure. i i would agree with all that uh, yeah I, I enjoyed reading it um it's uh anyway we'll, we'll talk about that some yeah, more totally um, so the reason that i got into this book at all is that britta london wrote, writes for the tv show riverdale and we love riverdale <laughs> question mark question mark question mark <laughs> um yeah she co-wrote co an episode that 
had good parts and bad parts, and we wondered whether she wrote the good parts or the bad parts I or what. I suspect she wrote the good parts because I think she, so. she can write. Yeah. But I. I mm. Yeah. So. <laughs> Save it. Save it for next time, Carrie. Oh, I will. So uh, um, so this is my segue into mentioning that our podcasting network, Your Trumpet Audio, has a Patreon. And if you give money to it at $5 a month level, you can hear us talk about the entire first season of Riverdale. You want to. And uh, actually, I think we're going to record a thing about the Josie and the Pussycats movie. Yeah, we are. Which this weekend, which is also going to be some oh bonus content. And you you will want to hear that. Y'all, I unabashedly love the Josie and the Pussycats movie. Yeah. I am not ashamed to say it. I think it's fun and kind of amazing. Get ready, Jacob. Um yeah, I'll strap in. <laughs> um so yeah, so that's my little plug for the Patreon. Uh and, uh, you know, we get our share of the Patreon money, which is not a, t- a whole ton at this point, but we very much appreciate it when we get yes, it. Yes, it's fantastic. So pay us and yeah. love us. Love us. So you can visit eartrumpetaudio.com for all of your podcast needs. Uh, you can follow it on Twitter or on Facebook, Ear Trumpet Audio. And... Um, there are a ton of other great podcasts on the network. Uh, I'm going to mention, so, uh, us and the, um, please don't send me into outer space podcast, which is, talks about science fiction and fantasy movies are in this kind of slow rolling, uh, karaoke war or co- thing. Oh, we are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you want to hear more podcasts like us, check out our podcasting network at eartrumpetaudio.com. I want to talk about the latest episode of Love Ya Like Crazy. Love YA Like Crazy. The reason why this episode is interesting is because they refer back to our episode where I talked about the fact that they didn't sing Hold Me Closer, Necromancer. And there's some great karaoke at the end of the episode to show that Jacob actually does sing. So I just want to say we got called out. So I'm going to need some singing from you guys. Take a space ride with the cowboy. Yeah. In a way, it's back in our court, but I would like to get other air trumpet audio shows involved in this. So one that I think could be good. Uh, is uh, They See Me Rolling, which is an, an Dungeons and Dragons podcast that I've listened to about half the episodes of. Um, so I'm way behind, and maybe they are already singing karaoke songs. I know that they do some kind of music for it. But mm-hmm. uh, anyway, I, would, I, I, I think one of the members of They See Me Rolling listens to Love You Like Crazy. And so if they listen to this and they would like to sing a little song for us at the end of an episode i will probably hear it in three months and uh, then we can respond to it that <laughs> one as well so yeah. thanks <laughs> what else should we say thanks to everyone who listens yes. um i appreciate it i appreciate that you listen to us being weird and loving books because not only do i love jake like crazy but i love yell like crazy yeah uh. <laughs> and and thanks to the sentimental favorites for letting us use their song hey there uh, for our theme music, which is probably playing under this right now. <laughs> so, um, I, uh, it's great seeing you, Carrie. It's good to see you. I love doing this in person because then it sounds better it sounds and I better. get to hang out with you. I know. And so y'all, we're going to go eat food. Oh my um, God. cause I'm hungry. I think Jacob is hungry. So, um, bye. Bye. Give me a call when you get back. Hey there. Hey. Love Ear Trumpet Audio.com. Ideas and entertainment. Loud and clear. <laughs>